Teen Summers, please welcome Andy Martineau. We're going to be speaking with her today on how to get your children to listen through connection. Imagine that. Welcome, Andy. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I love love talking about parenting. I love what you guys are doing, blending work and family and making it all work. It's beautiful. So well, thanks for leading I, this conversation out. I awesome. think what a uh, got me um, my most attention when we started reviewing and, and researching you was the reformed yeller. I think that's what we. <laughs> all want to so when you said that, I know that's something of uh, great interest, probably to the whole community of of w- what is a reformed yeller and how do we all become one? Oh I'm my gosh! Today, <laughs> you're not much of a. Yeller. I'm not much of a yeller, but you know, it's usually like goofy yelling. Yeah, true. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I mean, Reform Deller is, you know, not a, not a title I wanted to really own. I would rather say never have yelled, but when I had, yeah, it's so many kids, it's six kids in eight years. And so it really gave me this perfect storm to learn how to control my nervous system. So learning how to go from getting frustrated and being frazzled all of the time with my kids to not yelling really started with this moment. It was kind of this magical moment, really. I couldn't, I couldn't explain it. I didn't deserve it, but I had been busy. I had five kids at the time and I realized it had been about 30 minutes. I'd been killing it, you know, doing the laundry, feeling like, yes, I'm, you know, finally, I'm going to accomplish something today. And then I realized how quiet, quiet it was. So I started looking for the toddlers that were somewhere in my house that couldn't be accounted for. And I, yeah, I sneaked into the playroom, which was a two car converted garage. And so it just had the doorway, like, you know, the entrance of a regular door. So I had to be very sneaky to peek in to try not to um, disturb them in their play. And I realized they had grabbed the Costco size bottle of baby powder and just doused the whole thing. My daughter's like, there was flour too. We talk about it now. I said, <laughs> oh my gosh. I just remember the baby powder whiff, you know, coming out and I, I lost it. I had this moment. It was pretty typical, but I lost it. I was tired. I had a newborn. I was just tired. And, and I went in and started doing all the corrective stuff, you know, lecture consequence, all, you know, just really, really frustrated. And I saw my about three or four at the time, my three or four year olds gaze go from happy. Look at this creation we made to just, just distraught and destroyed. And I was able to pause in that moment and calm myself down. I didn't know what I was doing, but I calmed myself down. I went from super heightened emotionally, really triggered nervous system to being able to enjoy just the parenting moment and see the the goodness in my kids instead of what they had been doing to work against me. And that moment led me to really be determined to figure out how to be like that every time. So I I had kind of gotten lazy and tired and just thought, you know, there's, I have five kids, you know, and at the time I ended up having one, one more year later than that. So added to the bunch and had six, but at the time five, and I was just exhausted. And I thought this is the best I can do. I've tried everything. I'll keep trying everything. And that set me on a trajectory to figure out, I don't ever want to yell. I mean, I'm probably going to yell again. I'm probably going to lose my patience, but my goal is to not yell. And it was already my goal, but I had seen in that moment that it was possible to calm myself down, even when I was super escalated. And um, yeah, it set me off to say like, okay, what, how did I do that? I reverse engineer it. It took me a couple of years to figure it out. What's the science behind it? Because my degree is in nursing and I need science and data to prove it. I didn't want to be a passive parent. And I was afraid if I, you know, stopped yelling that not, not that I needed to yell, but if I stopped using corrective forms of parenting, you know, discipline and consequences and that the kids would just go crazy. So ultimately started to find developmental psychology and neuroscience and all of these things that really fed into me forming a a way of understanding my mind and calming my nervous system down and learning how to control myself better 
really looking at, oh, it starts with me. Oh, shoot. I thought it was about fixing the kids. <laughs> you know, I better do some internal work on myself and get myself, get myself together. So that's the journey that led me to really not give up on the process of figuring it out, seeing it's possible, figuring out the steps and, and yeah, just being focused on it, it became my, you know, my full-time job, really my full-time focus. So awesome. yeah. Yeah. A lot of times uh, when people hire us to coach them as parents, they want us to fix their children. And then we, uh-huh. just, we can't help you because that's <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's not about that. I, and it's so difficult because, you know, as you, as you even just said, now, as you were talking in the moment, your children were, what your children were doing to work against you. And so like, you had such a perspective, like these, you know, tiny humans have gathered together in a mutiny against me. Why? <laughs> That's what it felt why, like. Why did they hate <laughs> me? Like, and, and I get that. And I think uh, uh, so many parents get that, but it's just not about you. And I think that's like right. the greatest answer and the most difficult answer, right? Like you can't, it's, it's yeah, not. no, it's, well, I used to have believe in that conspiracy because when you're tired <laughs> and you're that, or you're like, they did I'm that on purpose. So they were yeah. planning that to, and, and yeah. you can step back and look at the absurdity. But in the moment, it's tough, as you said, especially mm-hmm. when you start to stack multiples and multiples. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it is a, just that, that amazing point of awareness, if you can mm-hmm. catch yourself intentionality that intentionality yeah. how how do you help people catch themselves yeah it's a great question i mean the the first part is really understanding what's going on i i think we brought up a great point realizing okay when i'm in my highest thinking i realize the kids aren't trying to form a mutiny against me so that's a great step yeah. um but also what are the stories i have around my kids' behavior. A lot of us, the parents, just inadvertently find a lot of our success. We find validation by how well or how not great our kids are doing. And so really understanding my, I can't get my validation or my worth out of my kids' behavior. My success as a parent has nothing to do with their behavior. It has to do everything with my behavior. And so understanding my own mind, my own behavior, what's causing my emotions that are fueling my actions, that's the that's one of the first steps that is critical for them to be able to see why is this my reality? You know, if I think my kids are rude and so then I feel frustrated, when I talk to them about their behavior, it's going to be flavored with that tone and that emotion and that judgment and the mere neurons in my brain are going to be sending out that signal and they're going to be picking up on it. Our kids can map really beautifully and much better than we can, you know, we want to admit, you know, we can be smiling, but still have frustration in us and they pick up on the frustration. They see right past the smile. So we can't fake it. And so understanding that and looking at ourselves first is critical to being able to show up differently with our kids and interrupt the pattern and shift the way we we are being with them. And Andy, you have a best-selling book, The Connect Parenting Method, or Connect Method Parenting, forgive me. Yeah, no, and, you're good. And in there, can you give us like tactical steps that that you teach in your book to help you know, acknowledge and like start to move toward that better way, that more connective way, that more connective way. Yeah. There's two big things. Well, I talk about a lot of things in the book, but two things that apply to, to what you're asking. One I call dear and it's an acronym S T E A R. I do know it's spelled wrong. You got to love acronyms, right? But it's, it's a framework for really doing what we were just talking about doing, really understanding my own mind. So the S is the situation. And I have parents really get clear and take away all the adjectives by just putting the facts of the situation. So often we want to say the kids were messy or they were rude or they were frustrated. But if 
if we can't get a group of 100 people to all agree that this is rude behavior, then we need to just take that away and say that, that what they said or what the room looked like. And so we really try to neutralize what's happening to get all the drama out of it because we have, you know, our brains are meaning making machines. And so we got to stop that. So that would be step one. And then when we're, as we're reflecting back on a situation and we have that clearly defined now, what is the situation? The, um, the bedroom had 20 items on the floor, the bed unmade, you know, we're very clear with that then what was my thought about it? And so this allows a parent to really understand the story they have. Like the kids are messy. They're going to be, they're lazy. They're never going to, you know, figure out how to take care of themselves. And then the emotion that comes as a result of that belief and everyone's belief is different. That's why it's super great to be very specific. Our brain wants to be very general and broad and do these sweeping over, over generalizations. And that doesn't, allow our subconscious brain to really go in and create new neural pathways. We've got to get specific. Mm -hmm. So that emotion, if it's frustration or resentment, that makes a difference. I, the, the parent needs to know, is, is it irritation or frustration or resentment or, you know, exhaustion? Because whatever that emotion is, it fuels our actions. I, I like to think of it like salt. It just flavors all of the stuff that comes after. And so if that's the fuel to my actions, I want that to be clean fuel just like a car, I wouldn't want to put dirty fuel into a car. It's going to affect the, the way it runs. That's going to, the emotions are going to affect the way my actions are received, the way that my child and I, you know, create a relationship after that. And so looking closely, at, okay, I was really resentful. And so then I stormed, you know, then I go into the actions, which is the A. What did I do? I went and said something. I was snappy. I got, you know, just on and on. And then the result, which is the R, helps them really see their the life they're creating. And now I can see from point A to point B how I'm creating it. And it takes all the guesswork. It makes it not so messy. And it really creates clarity. So somebody can look at that with curiosity, no judgment, because if we get judgmental, we're just triggering our own nervous systems again, and we're not going to be able to make good decisions. But if we can look at it like a scientist would just look at a problem they were trying to solve, or a business owner is looking at a problem in their business they're trying to make sense of, then now I can see what is happening and what I want to create instead. And so we move them through from a, I call it an unintentional steer to an intentional steer. And that's really helpful to understand what's, what's actually happening. Because sometimes we just get so stuck in our stories and those subconscious stories are so powerful and strong that, and we've practiced them so many times, they just become our unquestioned truth. And so we have to see that it's an optional story that I could change if I wanted to. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. And we were actually just at a family retreat that we do every year in the keys with a couple of other families, mastermind and a man named David nice. Zellman. David Zellman presented, he wrote a book and he may have written a couple of books, he but has, specifically yeah. what he talked to us about was the difference between an automatic conversation in your head and an intentional conversation in your head. And what I'm hearing you say is very much yeah. our triggers and those, you know, S T E A R well, S T E A are all the stories that are automatic and that we tell ourselves it's not really the true stories it's just all the stuff that we bring in and because we do bring it all in don't we we do we do bring it all in and yeah I, that's exactly the same thing I'm saying right as we we have these stories we practice so many times or because of how we were raised or because of how society has taught us so they're just automatic and our subconscious brain I I was looking at a study and I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's, I don't know, 10 times more, it, it processes 10 times more bits, or maybe even more than that, 100 times more bits of data per second than our conscious brain. And so once a story goes subconscious, you know, it's just gonna, it's gonna run the show. It's, 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 a, it's a fast speeding train versus a, you know, hand cart that we're pumping on the tracks. And so that, the re a lot of yeah have like and, and it seems even our and and I always I feel like I'm always calling you out on this feel free to always call me out too <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I'm I, here. <laughs> but I feel like 
you know, to hear that that subconscious fires a lot faster makes sense to me because we, I have a joke. I'm like, gosh, once it goes in, no matter if it went in wrong, it just, it keeps, it, that, that's the story. And so even yeah. details, if he'll be like, remember when Michael fell and you're like, gosh, what, mom, how's Michael doing? I'm like, remember, not that Michael. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We've been through it a couple of times. But again, that's just a small example. No, of like you're right, though. Whatever it's, it's, input. The speed so it, train versus the hand cart is very it's, true. It's such a great. So you just have to keep the hand cart going to eventually drown it out? Or is, is if you're, yeah, I mean, because a lot of people are going right now, okay, that true, makes sense. True, true. Yeah. True, true. Speed train against the hand cart. How am I ever going to catch up? Mm. Yeah. You're, you're just in real in real life moments when that subconscious brain, especially when we're in fight or flight, because then the subconscious brain takes over for survival, that's not the time we're gonna override the old neural pathway. It's just gonna come in at full speed ahead and take over. So the work really has to be done before or after the moment. So we're preparing ahead of time, just like an athlete would. They don't, uh, you know, uh, Someone who's pitching in the major leagues isn't figuring out how to do it in the game. They have put in hours of practice yep. and so that they're prepared for the game. But that's not when it ends. After the game, they're watching tapes, they're getting coaching, they're still fixing their pitch. And so that's the same with parenting, really anything. We want to rewrite that neural pathway is we've got to prepare ahead of time. Then we go try it out. We may do great. We may not do great. That's what either way is fine. We learn from it and we try again. And so that's how we create a new neural pathway. And once that new neural pathway is in place and our brain has enough evidence to support it, it will start to outweigh the old one and become, you know, subconscious. It's, it's similar to driving. I have a a daughter who got her permit this week. And so, you know, oh. every single thing it's, it's overwhelming. And there's so much to think about and you can't quite figure out how to stay in the lane. We're figuring that out, you know, but pretty soon that's all going to become subconscious. So she's going to be able to do that and talk to people and, you know, all of the things that we do on, on the drive, you know, while we're driving the car, that's really remarkable because so much of it is on autopilot. So we just want to be more and more intentional to put beliefs that we really like on autopilot and then we get those habits in place and things just you know they, they fall into place so much easier things improve yeah do you think yeah. what do you think about using the same method in other relationships oh it works in every relationship i mean i focused it on to parenting because that is my love and my, you know, what I love to talk to parents about, but yeah, my husband all of the time, we, he said, you're doing it, you know, you're, you're using it on the relationship. I'm like, yeah, I am, you know, not in a manipulative controlling way, but he, he's like, oh, this, this works so well, you know, with him, with friends, with in-laws, it's all, it, cause it's all based in relationship science, right? Like that's where it really comes from. And then it's slightly altered if you're applying it to another adult because they have a fully formed prefrontal cortex and a developed brain and they're autonomous and they have different you know capabilities of of functioning in their world versus a child of yours that you know it isn't in the same place or has the same autonomy as an adult but underneath underneath the fundamentals are the same yeah that's great cuz i know that was a big aha for us when we started using our connection formula and our board meeting strategy yeah. with each other and with our parents and with yeah. our siblings, you know, it just became, we were it like, works everywhere. <laughs> transfers, you know, and it is, it is funny. Cause I think at first, you know, as you said, there's a little pushback, not so much pushback, but that feeling of, Oh, you're using your framework on me or like, <laughs> Oh, just because you say it in a friendly voice or whatever it may be. Like you sometimes will be like, Oh, just because you Waldorf it doesn't mean you're not <laughs> pissed underneath or whatever. <laughs> I love Waldorf. Yeah. But, so you know, good. and so I think there's these layers where people like, they know that this is what you're an expert in, you know, and so mm -hmm. but like, Hmm, are you, mm -hmm. are you, you yeah. me? You know? it's a hesitancy and then an appreciation, I think. Vice versa. Yeah. With the children, I think sometimes with things. Oh, that we sometimes do. they got your number, huh? Yeah. There yeah. And so how so the the most challenging of your six, Ooh. what would be your greatest advice to anyone else who has their most challenging? 
to meet your child where they are without judgment and to help them really know that there's that there's nothing wrong with them. You know, our kids when they're struggling and they're maybe at their worst, they're saying unkind things, they're they really, you know, are what society might call rude or disrespectful or any of those things. Our kids know that they're being rude or disrespectful because when they're off track behavior is so apparent that means their their nervous system is off track and that feels icky plus they just know what's socially okay they don't want to be unkind but you know sometimes their emotions get the worst of them and so reminding a child like yeah you might have done something unkind but that doesn't mean you're unkind you may have said something you know that was rude but that doesn't mean you're rude right we all do that sometimes and really reminding them especially as they're maturing i want them to have really great thoughts about themselves because teenagers which is the main phase i'm in right now teenagers they they are up but even tweens and toddlers like you want that internal story to be good and and us reassuring them that they're a good person isn't enabling bad behavior it's actually setting them up to be more confident in themselves to be able to look at themselves and really inspect their behavior and make a shift. So you got to meet them where they are and accept them for who they are and believe in them beyond the behavior, you know, believe in them more than they believe in themselves. Makes a ton of sense. It does. Yeah. Now, what if, what if there's a moment I'm trying, I'm trying to think of a great example and it's not happening. Um, but, you know, for example, when you came down and the powder and the flour and everything was yeah. everywhere. And I love a great mess. I do also like help when we clean it up. (laughs) Yes. You know, okay. So initial reaction, whoa, what in the world's going on here? Yeah. Then shifting into, oh, okay. They were having fun. They weren't trying to be malicious. We do have a task here now that needs to be handled. And so how do you go from, okay, I, 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 we had a little baby freak out on the inside, but it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And we got this guys, but let's teamwork it together to get it pulled together. And then how do you, because the behavior isn't bad because it is fun because, you know, all of those things, how do you yeah. communicate? Like, but next time, can we do it like this? <laughs> how do you get to the other side of like, you're not bad. You're amazing and wonderful. And this is fun. And don't ever do that to me. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a great, I mean, that's a great question. I I think that the key is just the relationship. So if I can get through that situation and get it cleaned up and we can have a fun time and I'm not, you know, just irate the whole time we're cleaning it up, then they're going to feel that. And I mean, when in that particular situation, my kids were not very big, they were pretty small. And so the best motivation I had wasn't logic and reason because they really don't think in that frame they just really can't like physiologically if you study the brain the prefrontal cortex does not come on till around seven so these were all pre-seven-year-olds there was no cause and effect logic and reason in the way us adults have it and so the the main mechanism i would say across all ages but especially when they're toddlers and they can't even figure out the logic and reason or even understand the magnitude of the mess is to just go to the relationship so that they want to choose to follow me because ultimately our kids have to choose us no matter what age they are you know we we have the role of a parent we have the responsibility of a parent but we don't have the right to parent that's something we have to earn you know our children really have to choose us to be their leader choose us to be the one that they listen to and that comes from how we create that relationship of trust and safety with them and so my kids at that age were a lot more likely to listen to my suggestions of, Hey, we can't use the baby powder for, you know, this kind of activity, but it, it was them choosing to listen to me because, Hey, mom's a safe person. She's got our backs. She understands us. She doesn't, you know, get frustrated with us. Even when we misbehave, I want to listen to her. And to the degree they can do that is questionable at three, four and five, But if you just keep remembering that that's the 
the foundation of your parenting. If you want to have impact and influence, it's about the relationship. It's about the trust. It's about the safety. Then the suggestions we make and the good intentions our kids have are going to eventually become stronger and, and more reliable. Can we revisit something that you said right there about the prefrontal yeah. cortex? Because I think that's really important. Um, I think I recently learned that it's not fully developed until like now there's like new studies showing like 27, maybe it is. Is that the, the I've heard, of- yeah, I've heard 25 for females, 30 for males. Is the, some of the that makes sense. males are slower. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so long. <laughs> that really helped me when I had someone tell us like, you need to be your teen's coach because they still don't have, you know, yeah. you to guide and encourage, but I had never heard that it, it wasn't something that even began to develop until seven, like the way in which right. you just, so that's new information that's for me to be able to use. Mm-hmm. Will you explain that? Yeah. I mean, just physiologically, the studies they've done on the brain now, which is so helpful because this information, when we know that, then our expectations of our kids, because it will be different Uh, for a lot of us. Once our kids start talking, we're we're thinking, okay, they're little adults. They get it. You know, Uh (laughs) that's not the case at all. So around, I mean, there's a range, you know, and it depends on every child's brain is a little bit different, the environment they're raised in, but around seven to 12 is when it starts coming online, when it starts forming, when they can start to see the prefrontal cortex area of the brain start to develop. And and then it just slowly matures as they grow, but it matures differently than we physically mature. Physically, you know, it's inevitable. We have a child, Every year they're going to get older. They're going to go through puberty. It's unless there's something physiologically at play, we can't stop that train. But emotionally and with the prefrontal cortex, it's not quite the same. So it starts coming on seven to 12, but they've done studies now with young men in um, juvenile delinquent halls and their prefrontal cortexes almost without um, exception is not developed on a typical, like like if you were to compare it to another 15 year old, that's more typical and, you know, doing well in school, their prefrontal cortexes are not the same. The young man in prefront in um, juvenile, you know, in a juvenile hall who has been detained is typically underdeveloped. And what they're finding now is it's the environment that that child was raised in. They weren't there's different reasons, but like either they weren't allowed to feel emotions. It wasn't safe to be expressing themselves. There was a lot of anger. There was, there were things going on that didn't allow them to have the emotional maturity that needed to happen. And the emotional experiences that needed to happen for the prefrontal cortex to develop in a way that they would traditionally see it. And so it's not the it's not the end for those young men. They, they found that they can put them in situations where they can intentionally help them develop that emotional um, capacity and their prefrontal cortex will develop. But unlike physical maturity, which is inevitable, um, the emotional maturity, which includes the, the development of the prefrontal cortex, it's spontaneous, but not inevitable. You know, if we don't have the right conditions, it can be delayed. And so it's just really good information for us to know that it takes time and the right kind of experiences. It's a cautionary tale too. Our, we can, as parents, have a lot of power. We can suppress the development of the frontal cortex. That's, that's pretty powerful to understand. And what yeah. is it responsible for? Can you explain that a little bit to us as well? Prefrontal, the prefrontal cortex is is one of the things that sets us apart from other mammals. So it allows us to think about our thinking, logic and reason, rational, you know, awareness. A lot of the the, the thinking that we associate with being more mature, being more, you know, of, of an adult comes along because that prefrontal cortex is starting to come online. So being able to feel our emotions is a great example. So animals have emotions, which is the chemical reaction to the you know, to, to things that are going on in their head and how they're processing situations. But 
feeling an emotion is more of a cognitive experience, giving myself the ability to process, oh, I'm feeling anger right now, or I'm feeling frustration right now. Let me process where that's coming from. Let me understand where that's coming from. Let me allow that emotion to be inside of me and go from frustrated or mad to surrendering or sad. That's all the function of the prefrontal cortex. So it's a really powerful part of our brain. I'm really grateful for it, but it's just nice to understand it a little bit more so that we don't assume our four-year-old has, has that fully functioning and that we hold them accountable. You know, why didn't you told me you wouldn't use this, do this again? Well, they don't, they can't think, they can't think from day to day the way we do. They don't understand cause and effect the same way we do. So it's not that we don't help them see, like it's good to set intentions, it's good to follow rules, but the expectation is different of how we, you know, expect them to actually do that. So, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Where can people learn more about you, Andy? Yeah, they can check out my book on Amazon or Audible, Connect Method Parenting. Um, my website is the same name. I try to keep things really simple, <laughs> connectmethodparenting.com. I have a free course people can go through that will take them through the high levels of it. And then my um, my Instagram is just my name, Andy Martineau. So those are the best places. Oh, good. Well, I definitely think people will be looking up. I learned a lot on the frontal cortex. It's like, wow, we can suppress or help develop. And yeah. That is great power, great responsibility. Do you teach yes. in your book, do you talk about activities to help encourage the development of the prefrontal cortex? I talk about how, yeah, I talk about how to promote emotional well-being and intelligence. And I don't, I don't necessarily call it out, like do these exercises to enhance the prefrontal cortex, but really that's what it's doing. Um, that's one of the, the really beautiful ways as parents, we can help our children grow emotionally, develop that prefrontal cortex is by providing safety and helping our children have a safe place to really feel and experience all the emotions they're, they're going through. So it's trickled throughout the whole book. Nandy, do you see as parents respond opposed to react and, and are creating these safer mm -hmm. spaces, are the children magically better? Like, is there so, do you, <laughs> like, wow, it's amazing. I'm better and now they're better. It's just, do you hear a lot of that from people who follow your method that they're like, wow, this is so much easier than I was making it? Yeah, I'm a lot of parents. I've said exactly what you said to me, you know, um, the thing that's interesting to know is sometimes it just takes longer than we think it's going to take. It's, it's an, it's a whole body uh, way of parenting. And so it's not just, uh, it's, it's like the difference between going to a regular doctor. If you have a Maybe you have a rash and they just give you an ointment versus a functional medical doctor who might still give you the ointment, but it's also going to say, okay, what's causing this? You know, maybe is there something internally? And so we are coming at it from all angles. And so it makes a difference in how the parent shows up, which makes a difference in how the kids are, you know, being able to interact in their environment. And there is a trickle effect. And sometimes it's super fast. And I love it when that happens. So that's so fun. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for the child to say, okay, mom, is mom for real? Do I, can I really put my defenses down and trust that, you know, she's not just trying to get me to do something, but inevitably if they stick with it, it makes a huge difference in the relationship and in the parent's ability to stay calm and connected and confident, no matter what those kiddos are doing. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Andy, and helping us understand how important connection and safety and trust is in all relationships, but especially in that primary relationship with our children. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on.